Hey, this is wonderful. Thanks very much for um, all of you joining us here today to uh, talk about decarbonization, de decarbonization work at the National Academies. My name is John Holmes. I direct the Energy Board here at the National Academies. I'm joined by um, Brent Hurd, Kasia Kornacki, Rebecca DeBoer, and Jasmine Bryant, um, all staff on the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology. Environmental system. Gosh, you know, I'm I always repeat my old board and I haven't been there. And 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 I know Mary Lee is, is laughing because I left that board like 10 years ago. So I am with the board on energy and environmental systems. Oh my gosh, it just somewhere in my brain there's one synopsis that has two um uh, uh languages, too many acronyms. What is Okay, I pushed this one. Okay, okay, whatever, whatever. Okay, so I wanna make it clear that the Energy Board isn't just about decarbonization. We also do studies on the electricity system, on transportation, on energy innovation. And while those include components of decarbonization, if you think about something like the electricity system, and Brent will talk a little bit more about that, Decarbonization is an important element, but so is affordability, so is resilience. Um, so our energy board does more than just think about decarbonization. Okay, but what we're here to talk about is the de decarbonization initiative at the National Academies. Um, Marsha McNutt in her far fireside chat mentioned that the National Academies has been thinking, has been working on um, climate change mitigation through greenhouse gas emissions reductions for decades. That's absolutely, you know, the way we've operated. But the steep decarbonization initiative really came about during the 2017, 2018, 2019 time period when our staff, the wonderful volunteers that work with us, um, the general public, were concerned about the emerging severe impacts of climate change and the lack of engagement by the federal government in the topic. We're a soft money organization. So, you know, we, we, we can't just say, okay, so we wanna do something on decarbonization. But what it also made us do is go out to our expert community, to our staff, to others, to talk about what our value proposition and what might be priorities in our work over this 2018, 2019 time period. How did we do this? Well, a lot of times with bake sales with bringing people together over coffee and baked goods to talk about what the National Academy's value proposition is. That's how you get staff to come to anything you do. Um, also for our board meetings, we can bring in people physically and virtually to talk about what our value proposition outside experts might think. Um, we were fairly successful in those discussions over the 2018-2019 time period to interest um, a philanthropic organization to help sponsor our first foray into this deep decarbonization initiative, deployment of deep decarbonization technologies, which we did in 2019. What was interesting about that is that through the, those discussions and subsequent ones, it really made it clear that our value proposition not is in doing the ultimate technology map for how to get to net zero by 2050, the nirvana, you know, how do we, what does nirvana look like in 2050 with a, with a zero emissions energy system, zero net? Because it's really the transition that is important. And it's not just about technology and technology transition. It's really thinking about the policies that are needed and the societal dimensions of that transition that are fundamental. That was clear in our discussions with the experts. It was something that we were already thinking about, but it was a change of mode for how we operate within the Energy Board. Our first um, workshop was successful enough to raise funds for a follow-on consensus study. And let me be blunt, when we started out that consensus study, we had one idea. We were going to take in 2020, we were gonna take two years to do a consensus report. We were gonna do a workshop in the middle. We got the committee together. They said, that's a stupid idea. What you should be doing is planning for a report that would hit the streets 
in early 2021 that really focuses on immediate priorities for decarbonization. And no matter what would happen in the election of 2020, there was going to be a change in the administration priorities, whether it's the same administration or a new administration, there was going to be a change in priorities. The committee, of course, was right. And so what we decided to do was early 2020, we met, had the committee meet physically here at the National Academies building. In March of 2020, we set about a time frame, an outline that we were going to produce a report in 2021 that focused on federal priorities and what we should be doing out of the box. The first 10 years to put us on a trajectory to reach net zero by 2050, but especially to meet 50% emissions reductions by 2030. We left that meeting and we closed down the National Academies building for the next two years. But during that virtual time frame, that was kind of a good time to get your experts to meet around Zoom. So the committee continued to work and we released a report in February of 2021 that was fundamental for looking at what would the federal government should be doing straight out of the box to do decarbonization, accelerated decarbonization. I'll talk just real briefly about that one, but that we're, we're going to talk then about mainly our second report, because our second report was what we did in between the last summit, last time we talked to this group, and um, and now. All the activities, though, I must emphasize, we consider the technological dimensions as well as the uh, um, policy and societal dimensions. I said, you know, this group, we're brilliant, okay? But it's really the committees that do this work. This is voluntary service for the country on our study committees. This is the group that produced the first and or the second report. Some of the people wrote around for two, two reports. Some people joined for the second report um, and people left after the first report. But this is the group. And you'll notice expertise across society, health, environment, policy, energy sphere, um, members of all three national academies, young, old, um, a great group of experts to put on a, such, a, such an assignment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about stats, although stats aren't, you know, they're kind of empty, except the one I highlighted, which is our first report was, was the all-time bestseller, all-time most downloaded report I've ever, that the National Academies has ever done in the energy space. I mean, that's the kind of impact we had with that first report. I also show a little bit about how people, what people use this report for, you know, some of the comments, Rebecca has been spending a lot of time weeding through these comments. If you ever download a report from the National Academies website, we give them away for free. We give PDFs away for free. Take the comments seriously because we're we're trying to assess how people are using them. We see them used at the subnational level for policy development. We see them used in industry. We see them used by the public. We see them used in education. So it's really neat. Um, is it me? Yeah, it's me. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the report that we did in 2023 that we released in October of 2023. I was here um, at the CCX back in July. So I was talking about what was going to be released, even though I couldn't talk about what was in the report. Um, but what was important, what happened between 2021 when we released the first report and 2023? Only a policy revolution that happened associated with putting it's an, it's an industrial policy, it's an energy policy. We never have that in the United States, but we do now, or we did after a series of legislation that put climate, that put just transition, that put innovation, that put onshoring of manufacturing at the center of legislation, executive orders, and regulatory activities. That's what happened. That's, what, that's why the second report is this size, versus the first report being this size, we had a lot of stuff to look at. We had to, and 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 that really informed how we, how we did that second report because we didn't want to release a report that said, oh, this is what the federal government should do or this is what states would do without understanding what had already been done. 
And so our focus in the second report was really thinking about the gaps in the policy portfolio, the barriers to implementation of that policy portfolio. And the report really is a matrix structure. It discusses the cross-cutting societal objectives of an energy transition, that we need to meet energy justice, we need to have public engagement, we need to improve public health, we need to consider workforce in the energy transition, as well as chapters on sectors, the electricity sector, the transportation sector. So we went in depth in all of those to focus on what are the gaps and the barriers to policy implementation in each one of these sectors and each one of these cross-cutting issues. Um, to say it was a simple report would be an understatement because it wasn't. Um, and, and this is where we had 80 specific recommendations associated with a broadening policy portfolio. If you know anything about the CHIPS and Science and IRA and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, those are a lot of carrots, not a lot of sticks. Um, and so there was, you know, you, you can't rely on a, on a single methodology in terms of a policy portfolio. Um, you know, rigorous and transparent analysis and reporting. Evaluation is going to be so critical for us. Right now, I, I'm sure, and I was talking with somebody earlier today about the number of the amount of money that has been allocated for electric vehicle chargers versus the number of vehicle chargers that are actually on the ground being implemented. So we need to understand and we need to be monitoring and we need to be evaluating that those programs to make sure we're getting as much out of them as we hope. Um, there's, there's eight other categories of overarching recommendations. We have within our um, uh, dissemination materials on many of these, we have the specific recommendations drawn out on how the committee thought. Our, our chair, our committee was amazing about making specific recommendations. Who should do what? Um, it's really an impressive group, like I said. Um, one of the questions I often get, or one of the questions any of us get at the National Academies when we do consensus studies is, why does it matter? How does the stuff that you do impact the activities? And, and so we're spending, uh, Rebecca and, and the rest of the staff are spending a lot of time, Jasmine, on evaluation itself. And we look at evaluation in a lot of different dimensions, but the first one is obviously the alignment of federal and other policy portfolio um, with what we recommended. Um, we also look at, you know, when people cite our work, um, especially in, in, in different types of, of letters from Congress or whatever. And we also look at just anecdotes, you know, when, when people talk about how our report is, is, you know, when they show it at a conference or whatever. Um, the one I've highlighted here is really the number and the extent of implementation of recommendations, I'm gonna call on you, Re uh, Rebecca, to, to be specific. We had 30 recommendations within the first report. We've seen at least 25 of those recommendations at least partially implemented. Rebecca, what did you find when you looked at this a second ago? Yeah, so uh, we had 30 recommendations in the 2021 report and seven of them have been implemented pretty much exactly aligned with what we recommended. Uh, and 18 have been implemented in some capacity. Sometimes that's partial because it's not the entirety of the recommendation. Sometimes it's uh, marked as partial in our evaluation because uh, perhaps we gave a certain percentage and the percentage that ended up in the regulation or the policy is slightly different. But regardless, 25 out of 30 to actually see forward motion on policy um, and to see regu regulations and actions taken is really awesome. Um, I think one of the, you know, for an example of how uh, far reaching some of our recommendations that didn't see action are, one of the ones that didn't see action is a price on carbon. I'm sure none of us are surprised that that hasn't happened in the last year, but it, you know, 25 of them had things that people in the federal government were able to say, yeah, we can make that happen. And uh, 
pushed through to to make it so. And then um on the right hand side of this slide is a letter that um, members of both the House and the Senate sent to FERC where they cited our report um, front and center. And uh, we like to think that was helpful to FERC as they uh, decided on their regulation that they put out earlier this year. Good. Um, and then we also noticed a big alignment within one of the conclusions, one of the uh, recommendations within the report in the building sector was that um, the the mid-century um, Biden administration decarbonization plan did not really push the building sector very hard. In fact, it didn't even meet what the committee had recommended in the first report for emissions reductions. Um, you know, I think I think um, it's the 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 midterm report had about nine percent emissions reductions coming directly from the building sector. Our our report said you could get a lot more out of buildings. What ended up happening in in twenty twenty four is the Biden administration released the first federal and DOE blueprint on building sector, and we noticed an alignment. They didn't cite our report. I don't care if they cite our report. It's just nice to see that they that they tighten down on the building sector. That's the key. Um, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go back to this wonderful article that um, the associate director um, Beth Zittler wrote with uh, with uh, Christine Mirzon Fellow, looking at a whole bunch of our vehicle fuel economy reports that were going on since 2005 to or 2002 to, to 2020, uh, 2015, and the number of recommendations and the overall implementation of those recommendations. And we really, did, she did a wonderful job. They did a wonderful job really looking at the implementation of these massive set of recommendations. A lot of them are pretty detailed, are pretty geeky. These reports are kind of technologically, you know, rich, but it's important to note the 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 percentage of, of uptake in those. Um, we're continuing the second report um, because it's so big, we get to continue to disseminate. We're we're actively we re released it in October, and I am still. We are still having the committee. The committee is wonderful. They're still getting together and doing briefings. If anyone is interested in, you know, your group would love to hear um, the National Academies present this report. Present what we're thinking about in the future. We're going to talk about that with Kasha and with Brent. Um, please reach out. This is this is a partial group, and we're doing all sorts of of different ways of dissemination, including you know um, going to bookstores and doing a reading or doing an Instagram live type event. So we're trying to we're trying to do different things with dissemination too. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kasha to talk about what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing. And Brent, cool. Um, so this next slide. What we're hoping to showcase is the exciting work that we've already done this year and some of the events that are coming up. Um, so I'll quickly just run down this list of topics and we'll expand on them in some of the upcoming slides. Um, so we kicked off the year with a workshop on how social science can help inform the path of the clean energy transition. Um, there is already a proceedings published from that workshop, so you can download it online and read it. Um, then, um, we followed that up with another workshop on community benefit agreements and how important they are for planning new energy projects. And I will expand on that one on the next slide. Um, we did a workshop on electricity system complexity, which Brent will talk about in a moment. Um, and proceedings from both of those will be published, um, later this year. And, we have some additional exciting activities coming up in the fall. So we're going to have a workshop on macroeconomics. Um, we're going to have a workshop on artificial intelligence and the energy demands of that. Um, we're going to have a workshop on the deployment of new nuclear projects and a workshop on transmission siting along right-of-way corridors. Um, and then we're, this may be next year already, but we're, <laughs> um, but we're hoping to do a workshop on the social cost of carbon, which I think will be a big one. And this is one of the critical questions for decarbonization. Um, so you can see that we're going to dive into a lot of topics that 
are really relevant to deep decarbonization and that build on the body of work that we already have with the decarbonization study that John presented on. Um, so looking into the future, we're just hoping to build on that and explore a lot of new issues and opportunities as they come up. So this slide is really foreshadowing our hopes for what we want to do with decarbonization moving forward and building a forum, which Brent is going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but before he does that, um, I wanted to highlight just a few things from the community benefits workshop that we did just a couple months ago, um, because one of the major challenges with the energy transition, um, no matter how many great technologies are out there or how much financial support exists or how many incentives are out there. Um, every mitigation related solution, whether it's transmission or new generation resources or, or mining, what have you, um, all of that is going to ha have to happen somewhere in some community of people who have to deal with the immediate consequences of whatever that new infrastructure or technology brings with it. Um, so for, for a truly equitable transition, um, you know, the, the communities that these technologies and, um, and other pieces of infrastructure are built in, those communities are going to have to benefit in order to support it. Um, so we explored that in this workshop. I don't know why. All the texts. Okay, there it is. All right. So uh, importantly, DOE has recognized the importance of um, planning major energy projects in collaboration with the host communities for those projects. So the workshop aimed to understand um, DOE's community benefit planning process. And we also wanted to situate that in um, some some context, some historical examples of community benefit frameworks that uh, have been around since before DOE's community benefit planning process existed. Um, and we also spent a lot of time discussing um, what is needed for long-term and proactive community engagement to really help the energy transition take off and have communities prepared um, for everything that needs to happen over the coming decades. Um, so the workshop was a real success. We played with a variety of activities that were kind of new for us. We had some interactive art. We had a role-playing game. We had a fishbowl session, which tries to get um, all of the participants in the room included in the discussion rather than just a panel of speakers. Um, so I think it really helped uh, get everyone feeling included and engaged. So um, it was a great workshop. I'll pass it on to Brent to talk about our other fun workshop this year. Thanks, Kasha. We wanted to put a spotlight on our work on the electricity system because one of our major strategies for decarbonizing the economy is to electrify a lot of sectors of the economy. And, you know, like a, a very high profile end use, of course, being electric vehicles, but also looking into industrial electrification and further electrification in buildings, among other sectors. And so in this way, the electricity system really is part of the backbone of a net zero energy system. And we at the Board of Energy and Environmental Systems really have a long legacy um, of work on the electricity system. So the four pictures that are up on the slide are the consensus studies we have done since 2012. You, you'll see that we started by being commissioned to do a very security focused one on terrorism and the electric grid. But in 2017, we had a very high impact report on resilience in the nation's electricity system, which we actually still see cited a lot. Um, in 2021, we had a committee that was tasked with envisioning what potential futures for our electric power system might be. And then in 2023, we had a congressionally mandated study looking at the future of net metering, so compensating behind the meter distributed uh, generation, usually solar, and what that might look like in an evolving electricity system. 
Um, and in addition to these four studies, we've had four workshops uh, during that time frame, and we have two upcoming, which Kasha highlighted, both reinventing the right of way for use in transmission siting, and also AI and energy use, which of course draws a lot of electricity. And uh, as you heard from the panel, which kicked off the summit, is clearly a topic uh, of a lot of uh, discussion lately. And so, you know, electrification, as I mentioned, it's a key means for decarbonizing sectors of the economy. But at the same time, we wanted to underscore the electricity system is undergoing concurrent changes. It's becoming more distributed. It's taking on a lot more digital elements. And so that was really the subject of this workshop, which was held in this building um, just about a month ago. Um, and it was on operability and reliability of our electricity system as it takes on a lot more complexity and increasing complex elements. And we just wanted to highlight some of the takeaways, um, again, because this is really relevant for how successful we're going to be at decarbonizing the energy system. Uh, so that's a picture of some of our lovely panelists. Um, and one of the goals was to understand how to maintain and improve the operational integrity of the grid while it takes on a lot more distributed and complex elements. Also, while attaining our goals of decarbonization and our objectives of a just transition in terms of serving equity and justice outcomes. Our first session was simply titled, What Keeps Grid Operators Up at Night? We had a lot of people uh, with experience directly in terms of managing the reliability of the electricity system talk about what are the things that are really sitting in the back of their mind and weighing on their mind in terms of the continued integrity of the grid as it undergoes all these changes. Our second session took a little bit of a markets focus. So it was looking at how do we compensate distributed energy resources, DERs, while maintaining reliability objectives, uh, looking not only at market functioning, but also what are the equity outcomes from that? And how does that look in terms of consumer adoption? We had a number of smaller breakout sessions focused on topics including load growth from electrification, uh, equitable distribution planning practices, a lot of focus on transmission at the national level, as I'm sure you'll, you all are aware, but thinking about what do we need in terms of upgrading the distribution system, especially if we're hooking a lot more things onto the edges of the electricity system, as well as what are the corresponding cyber and physical security needs. And we had another plenary session that was looking specifically with a regulatory lens on how do we regulate this increasingly complex system as well. And so, as Kasha mentioned, the written proceedings for this and the Community Benefits Agreement Workshop are going to be coming out uh, in the back half of this calendar year. I do want to note the recordings for both of these workshops actually are available online. So if you go to nationalacademies.org slash bees, the abbreviation for our board slash events, they're pinned at the top of that page uh, for you to find. So we've outlaid a lot of our recent activities, but we want to end here by looking at what's next. And so we really want to convert on all of the activities that we've been doing and undertaking in terms of standing up what we envision to be a deep decarbonization forum. Um, in terms of what that would practically look like, uh, we would look at doing three to four annual convenings. You see on the top left of this slide, workshops. So those are what Kasha and I just described. They're one and a half, two days in length. Um, and they have discussions with invited experts and stakeholders, and they produce a written summary of what happened there. Forums at the National Academies can also have planning meetings, which are closed for forum members. So much like we have National Academies committees, like the one John highlighted with a large cross-section cross of experts, planning committees can have closed meetings to discuss emerging topics in particular areas. They can also do webinars, so public-facing, online, things that are responsive to emerging topics. And also a new product for the National Academies are workshop-based consensus studies. So a committee is appointed much like a consensus study committee uh, and they host one to two information gathering sessions that are public facing workshops. And then they can go behind closed doors and develop findings and recommendations with the National Academies stamp that then go through peer review and are produced. So this is sort of a faster, more nimbler way to do these consensus studies that we undertake. So in terms of what the specifics of this forum would entail uh, topically, you know, we think this would allow us to take a strategic approach to decarbonization. So all of the activities we've discussed, they're pretty ad hoc. They address issues that are either brought to us from Congress via legislative authority, from agencies approaching us with things they're interested in, or other sponsors, private or philanthropic. But standing up a forum that would have an existing committee would allow us to take a pretty deliberative approach and plan out something that is a little more, well, strategic.
This would allow also for rapid and continuous response to changing conditions in terms of how progress is going on decarbonization. It would help us continue to integrate both the technical and the social dimensions of decarbonization as we pursue it, and really make sure that we're incorporating the reality that we're just not going to attain deep decarbonization in the US without a social contract, which provides energy justice and prosperity to related communities. So we would have a stated objective of reaching directly to stakeholder communities, including environmental justice groups at local, state, and national levels, and keeping that input and those dialogues continuous throughout the time that this forum would operate. And this really just helps us recognize the long-term nature of this energy transformation. It's not something that's going to happen in the next five years. This really is a longer-term undertaking. And finally, this would really continue and build on the engagement that we've started to undertake and really do hope to continue to undertake with a lot of people like you in the rooms, experts and stakeholders who we've brought in from prior activities and hope to work with in the future. And so with that, I think I'll pause, I'll turn it back to John for any concluding remarks. And then I think we're opening the floor to you, right? Yeah, I, I, um, Jasmine, I, I, yeah, I was thinking, Jasmine, do you have the results of the first couple of slidos? Um, sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, let's just, uh, so what we want to do is, is understand the room. Okay. We have a lot of people from other, is that another country or is that another, um, a good, good. That's a, that's a fair, that's a fair assessment. Okay. And then. Love it. Love it. Oh, TIAA, I want to talk to you later on. I'm just kidding. I am just kidding. That's a joke. Um, uh, uh, perfect. Uh, this is, this is, this is so sweet. Lovely. Okay. Why don't we go to the first question? So, so really what we want to do is, is get, um, uh, feedback from, from people. Um, and what we want to do is get a sense in this room, what do you think your priorities are? You know, are you, are you technology? Do you think do you think the 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 decarbonization discussion should be you know about the technology dimensions, about the policy dimensions, about the societal dimensions? We have a DC oriented crowd. <laughs> We'll think about another 30 seconds on this one. Yeah, it is. A, it is a... Beautiful. Good. And when I when I when when I see policy, I'm wondering, is this policy implementation? I mean, I mean, what we're very concerned about obviously is is new policy, but policy implementation seems to be such an important element of the policy landscape. I don't know how many new policies we'll see on decarbonization at the federal level. Um, what do people, anybody that that picked up on policy, do you want to do you want to describe what you think when you when you respond to that? I know it's a general category, but but when you say that, um, or else I'll just start pointing at people. But that's that's another strategy. Yeah, I knew. You. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I, I, I think more, mostly in terms of implementation, because I'm looking at it from a grassroots level. How do I get my local utility to actually buy into decarbonization? And I would add to that, um, yesterday uh, through the um, workshop on um, medicine, on the medicine track, the Grand Challenge, they were talking about a hub that they're going to be launching where people can go and get information of that's been vetted by the academies um, to help them engage with their local communities. And I'm wondering, as I'm thinking about the policy implementation and the challenges we're encountering, if y'all would also consider doing that. During doing some information provision, you mean just standing like they had talked about with the hub? Yeah, for instance, um, the utility I'm engaged with talks the right language, but the act actions are not necessarily consonant with the talk. Um, and when one challenges that, one gets thrown a ton of lingo uh, and one is left kind of deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. And it would be great to be able to sort of be able to say, oh, actually, as a matter of fact, ISO New England says 
40 percent, uh, 40 years is the pole replacement age, not 20 years and things like that. Yeah. Good, good. Other, yeah, I see one in the back. Certainly feel free to come to a mic if you don't mind. Red. Is red good? No. Yeah, red, red is, oh. red is, yeah, even though it's singular. Just another plug for policy, not just at the federal level, but at the state and kind of local level. So whether that's, you know, as we see shifts and varies to more kind of state ownership of these kinds of decisions, how can states and then local governments have tools to create policy that would work for them? Uh, you know, not that that substitutes the federal policy, but uh, as a complement that can be used at that local level. It's a great point. We did put a subnational chapter within our last report because of that, but it, I I think you know we did we did a good job on that, but I don't think we did anything. Yeah. Could you, yeah, would you mind coming up? Yeah, sorry, David Kay, uh, Cordell University. Um, I work a lot of on, on solar, particularly land use aspects. So I'm, I'm not sure how these categories are defined. But what I would, what I would have wanted to answer was policy that is based on full understanding of societal impacts and technological impacts rather than trying to separate those. I mean, policy me, policy seems to me like it's the, uh, you know, the end game rather than a separate category. Um, and I would just echo what the other people said in terms of my own perspective about trying to, trying to work with uh, mostly at the state and local level rather than at the federal level using federal resources and, and frameworks as possible. Then the last thing I just want to say is about thinking about because I because one of the things I really appreciate about uh, I think the rhetoric, but not necessarily the practice of what we're doing is how we incorporate equity into into the transition, and in particular, you know, just putting together the presentations I just heard, like thinking about the issue of equity in terms of costs of energy generation to consumers who are often in different places, almost always in different places than where the communities are being most directly impacted are. So it's like figuring out how to balance sort of those community level impacts, which is what I usually work with, with sort of the more diffuse, broader kinds of impacts on people in other places. Also true of air quality, all those kinds of things where there's geography that is different in terms of where impacts happen. Sure. So I think that's a, a really great set of points. Um, you know, at John's suggestion, I do want to uh, note, we did take on some of these interesting elements in that future of net metering study that we have. And I believe there are copies out in the hall as well. But, you know, solar, as you know, is really interesting in terms of the potential for power generation, specifically distributed power. But also you have, and especially with utility school, solar, right, like these land use implications. And so I think it's, yeah, very much an active area that we need to think about in terms of balancing these different impact categories, for lack of a better way of putting it, whether it's GHGs, whether it's land, et cetera. Um, so, yes. Oh, here, the one right here. Yeah, you want to come in. Then... There you go. Hi there. My name is Liz Schumacher, um, and I am a, a former lobbyist and um government affairs policy professional. I now own a company that manages um, professional medical and scientific associations. And we're always working with our clients, our associations. I was thinking about the uh, auditorium presentation this morning around professional societies and organizations collaborating, which we're always trying to do to leverage all their thought leadership to really move things forward. Um, I'm also a patient entrepreneur and have had four kidney transplants. Um, and I've recently kind of gotten into this space uh, because as somebody who's immunocompromised, I'm more and more worried about the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations like me. And coming to the meet, I'm kind of here to learn a lot. But what strikes me here is um, I, I grew up in policy and being a patient advocate and things. But what strikes me here is there's the policy, but then the implementation that you're talking about. And I'm just curious in the room and with all of you, thoughts about um, working with business, um, hybrid partnerships, 
Um, you know, I think at the presentation, the financial presentation yesterday, there was discussion about funding from private equity and or from the, 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 the private and public sector to make these things work. So I'm learning so much and getting so many ideas about the things that could be done to improve and so much amazing thought leadership. But I'm thinking more about as you expand out of working with communities, et cetera, but what about partnering with, you know, incubators, business, um, others who can bring resources and operational skills to the table to actually implement some of these things and move them forward outside of just doing it through the public policy, um, legislative, uh, you know, um, kind of approach. Thanks for that question. That's really great. Um... I want to address one thing, and then I'd like to actually ask Kasha if you had any insights from the community benefits uh, work you've done in terms of thinking about um, drawing on local local business and, and partnerships in that respect. But the one thing I wanted to underscore that I found really impactful from the, the finance session yesterday was this observation that we're not going to be able to get to, decarbon to a decarbonized economy on public capital alone. It's really going to be necessary to engage private sector actors. Uh, as complements to any policy, whether federal or subnational. And so I really just want to underscore that. I think this is a really critical piece that clearly we're still trying to figure out how to wrap our arms around in terms of effectively engaging these private orgs and what they have to offer. And so, yeah, I was just wondering, Kasha, what insights there might be from your experience with that workshop. Yeah, I think that the the private sector plays a really crucial role, especially at the community level. I, we were focused really much on really on, you know, energy infrastructure and um, sort of manufacturing facilities and, you know, very engineering sort of industry during the workshop. Um, but, you know, those types of industries have a, a, a really, um, they're really connected to the communities that they have their plants and facilities in, and um, they uh, have have a lever in many ways over over those communities. Um, you know, depending on on what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, it, it, I I don't really know exactly how we as the national academies can. Um, can work with those entities, but yeah, well, yeah. But but also let's just say, you know, what you heard yesterday in the finance session would would flow over into what we would do in a decarbonization type forum. I, I you know, I mean, Brent is sitting here because, and he led that one because he's on the staff. He's, you know, we, we understand the realization that we can't do this with just public policy, you know, 101 or whatever. Um, let's do one more question in the back and then let's move on to the next slide. Oh, because we want to also get, uh oh, John Anderson, my boss's boss's boss. <laughs> or not, not, not that, you, but you, you know. You what? don't have a boss, John. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, just to, we use the word equity a lot. And I'm thinking in terms of uh, in, addressing impacts of climate change. Does the National Academies have a definition that we can all subscribe to for equity? I would I would direct people to our chapter two within this report. We go through a whole thorough discussion on energy justice, environmental justice, climate justice, and equity, and and try and distinguish between the two of them. I don't want to repeat that because that that discussion was written by experts. And I would just refer people to that rather than having me screw it up. Is that the first, the first report? No, the second report. Second, second report, report, chapter second, two. Second report, second chapter. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was it was well, you know, very well done. Um, I could plug the the committee members that wrote it. But um, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time because you're right. Definitions matter in all of this. And that's why we really tried to distinguish amongst climate environmental and energy justice and we focused on energy justice and it, john we distinguished different types of equity in terms of procedure recognition there's two others mm -hmm. uh i didn't write the chapter but we the yes. they were very uh careful to ensure that we weren't just using a single umbrella term to mean a lot of different things specificity was 
the name of the game with that chapter. So um, yeah, highly recommend checking it out. It was there one more question in the back? Yeah, and 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 then we'll go on to the next slide though, because the next slide will help. Yeah, me. I'll try to be brief. My name is Demarcus no. Robinson at UCLA. Um, my interest is related to shipping. Uh, my background is in oceanography, so I'm on a lot of research vessels. Uh, part of shipping, I saw that in the. I didn't read the, the chapter yet, but I know you have a chap section on transportation. And my interest is between policy and technology when it comes to greening our, our shipping fleet. Uh, the good example is uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography recently is going forward with uh, having a hydrogen ship, which is the first of its kind. Um, and so that's something to where it is. Uh, we'll see how it, it interplays, but it'd be very interesting to kind of have the academies kind of focus on that because uh, I don't think shipping gets a lot of interest and it's a little bit behind when it comes to other aspects of transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Scripps, they have a, they're a, I guess they're building currently their uh, hydrogen ship that's going to be completely built off hydrogen and it's going to be used for research uh, purposes. Um, so, so we, when we thought about decarbonization, we often think of it in three acts. The act one is what we're in now. The stuff, then, and, and you heard it in the finance chapter, the 50, 60% of where we know the solutions are now. Electric vehicles, electrify end uses, decarbonize electricity, improve energy efficiency, bam, uh, improve infrastructure. During this decade, we need to be figuring out stuff like shipping. We need to be figuring out things like, you know, flight heavy industry, heat, John mentioned heat, decarbonizing heat. That's what this decade is for, is doing the research, development, and demonstration of those technologies that we will need in the 2030s and beyond to continue along the net zero trajectory. Because our, our job isn't done with the simple ones. I'll let the guy in red and then we'll then we'll move on to the next slide, oh, Jasmine. Yeah, John Brown of Portland State University. So on that point, um, we hear discussions about uh, how we've got 50% or 70% or 90% of the technologies we need. I've yet to see a study that really lays that out. And maybe not a one pager, but maybe a 20 pager that says, here are all the technologies that we think we need. And this is what we need them for. And this is their state of development and kind of just like a technology cookbook yeah, so I, that we see it. I, I think our first report did that a little bit, but it was okay. more of a haiku. I mean, really, I, I I list off those five things because I really believe it is. It's electrification of light duty vehicles. We see that now. It's decarbonization of electricity. We know where that is. We don't know how to get from 50% decarbonized to 100%. Um, we know energy efficiency, we know electrification of end use, you know, we know the movement from um, natural gas to heat pumps. Those are some of the simple technologies that I think we can go a long ways with. Whether it's whether it gets us to 50, 40, 60 or whatever, there's just some low hanging fruit that we should be doing now while we're doing, while we're looking at whether it's hydrogen for shipping or whether it's electrification, I can't imagine electrification, sales. I, I, I don't know what it is for shipping. Um, and Jasmine, do you wanna do the second one? Cause, Cause this is, I think some of these second questions are really about the under or overemphasized questions, right? Am I wrong? We did underemphasize. Yeah. What is the under? <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot the order that we did these, but we really wanted, again, this is a great group to talk about, but, you know, what do you think that is, you know, an underrated decarbonization opportunity? Jasmine, describe how we respond to this one. Right with love. Oh, my gosh. I know. Oh. We trust these folks, I guess. I, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. And then we'll, we'll yeah. And if you're not good at typing, you'll be able to verbalize it too. Oh, I think it's <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah getting lots of good responses food food waste is on there yeah no well i'm seeing i don't know i'm seeing nuclear energy on here a couple times which i think is yeah yeah, I mean, I, like, I, I, I do agree that nuclear is kind of an underrated opportunity, but I think there are a lot of challenges and barriers to getting nuclear up and running, as we've seen in this country, at least getting really big gigawatt nuclear plants built. Describe some of your reports. You know, yeah. Sure. <laughs> a bug? <laughs> um but it, it, the construction of large nuclear facilities in this country has been really difficult. It's taken a lot of time, it's been over budget, um, and it really presents a huge economic risk to developers and people that want to um, bring new nuclear online. Um, so, you know, nowadays there's a lot of talk of small modular reactors, um, which could potentially be a great opportunity. Um, the the difficulty there is that um they're still being built they're still being demonstrated and uh they that needs to happen first before they can be deployed commercially and we go into depth in our report about the different small modular reactor technologies um and some of the opportunities and barriers with the different technologies um, and that report on advanced nuclear reactors and its companion workshop proceedings on the societal aspects of uh, advanced nuclear reactors are both out on the table outside, and you are welcome to help yourself uh, after this session. But, but yeah, that yeah, it has it has gotten a lot of traction, and actually, recently the Advance Act was passed um, by Congress, which has a, a lot, it incorporates a lot of the recommendations from that report, particularly with, um, in, in regards to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and um, how quickly they, they do their um, permitting work. Mm -hmm. So, That's why you need any direction in the technology because the water base are expensive accident prone, the small modular nano reactors are kind of different technologies. So it will help a lot if the if a study is made. And I understand uh, there is a lot of experimental kind of stage, but it's uh, accelerating. So this is the time in a sense to give it a boost rather than rely on the older technology and talk about the older the water-based reactor technology, in my view. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I think the the one issue is just timing, um, because we obviously want everything to happen really quickly. And I think one of the points that's made in the report is that nuclear reactors or the new the new ones, particularly non-light water reactors maybe sort of a longer term decarbonization strategy that may not be able to be deployed until, you know, 2040, 2050, um, at which point the electricity system may already be quite different because we have a lot of other technologies that we're talking about and drawing upon. Do you, do you have a comment? Sure. Yeah. I'm wondering a little bit. It seems to me that you're trying to get some feedback that supports or will help this next forum that you're contemplating yes which i'm expecting you're planning it to be a month and a half long uh based on the breadth of the some of the topics uh the decarbonization is this incredibly broad topic I, uh, hard, hardly anyone mentions the part of it i'm interested in you know uh, and so we all have 
uh, it's it's not blind men with an elephant. It's blind men in the zoo here. And I'm wondering if there's some something we want to focus on. Well, uh, and and let me just clarify what we're talking for a forum is you're you're right. It's five years. It's 10 years type activity. This is a this is a convening that would happen over a long period of time on different topics that are identified as being the most relevant at that time. And we can move around on topics, but it is certainly not one and done or one year and done the way we envision it, because you're absolutely right. It's not only a broad topic now. Imagine in five years, is it going to get simpler? Absolutely not. We're going to be have progress on many technologies. We're going to have some technologies that drop off the map that we that we you know that we explore for many years and then they just end up in a dead end. That's why we want a standing activity that's occupied over a long period of time. I I totally agree with you. No, it. I mean, sure, we could do one forum for a month and a half, but our volunteers would would yeah. kill us. I mean, they would they wouldn't do that. Also, I think that would probably get away from the intended purpose of this. Can I ask, sir, what topic yeah, do, yeah, yeah. You, do you think isn't getting mentioned enough? Can yeah, that's what tell us. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I do monitoring, reporting, and verification for carbon capture and storage. I'm, I kind of have a, a. That's a huge thing that we are interested in. Yeah, we, yeah. we and, just put out a carbon capture yeah. and utilization study last year that had a ton about wanting to do monitoring and verification. This study cares about that. And that's certainly something that we'd want to explore as part of the forum. Right. And, and so the, the issue is you look at all the other stuff that is going on and we have outside in, you know, that other world um, outside of the district, uh, probably, I don't know, we have a carbon capture and storage conference of some type or the other every day. Sure. Uh, you know, there's, and I'm sure that there's probably one for hydrogen and geothermal and then green vehicles and freight transportation and methane leakage topics. Um, and so what differentiates, I mean, what is the, the mission, the, the, what, what do you really want to have accomplished that is you uniquely suited for the national academies? Yeah. And you're sitting right next to one of the re, you know, one of the, the national academies has kind of a, a, a special, Okay. Oh, oops. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, the National Academies is a special imprimatur. We bring independence. We bring, you know, high quality people like yourselves, all of the people around here, high quality thoughts and minds together on issues like this. We have a little bit of a special relationship linkage to the Hill, you know, and to, and to Congress, they listen to us a little bit more than your average NGO, than your average conference on, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I think we have a little bit of in with that, but we're not going to rely on that as our total value proposition. We believe that we can convene experts in the broadest area. And that's, that's one of the areas that is, is kind of interesting. That's why we're also thinking about our value proposition as really linking the societal and the policy and the technology dimensions, because so many of these individual gatherings are really about one dimension and not all of the dimensions. So we hope that's that's part of a, a, a value proposition. But let me just say, we go to bed every night and we wake up every morning and think about our value proposition. Let me not, yeah, Mary Lee. Hi. Um, yeah. So I guess um, one question I have is about your value proposition or um, is, do you think that there would be value in providing more opportunities for discussion with um, curated experts, uh, committee members or others, um, you know, workshop speaker types as well, um, that that you all could um, put together to help folks that are trying to get these ideas implemented um, and have questions either about some of the complexities of the multi-dimensions and competing demands um, or competing uh, 
yeah, demands of some of the recommendations, or um, in my case at an NGO, I have questions about what metrics are most effective for us to be measuring. And I'm really uh, excited to hear, you know, a little bit about Rebecca's work tracking some of, you know, what things have been done, but we like to track you know, we can track how many EV stations, that one might be pretty straightforward, but what's measurement for me tracking whether or not um, things are equitable? Is it how many health impact assessments were done uh, by DOE? I don't really think that's the measure, but I as an NGO can track whatever we, whatever the scientists think is the best thing to be tracking to show success. So I guess that's my specific question is that tracking, but I think the broader thing is like, if the academies could continue to make those reports useful um, through like kind of ongoing implementation discussions, um, I, don't have to be recommendations and consensus. Well, we 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 looked around a little bit at, but I see other report cards coming out. You know, World Resources Institute, um, 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 Speed and Scale. Those folks are doing some of the report card issuing in terms of where we are with the different deployments. I'd hate to just take on a topic. And, and you know, we've talked about such a report card with Marsha. And with I wasn't the, suggesting a report card. Yeah. What I was suggesting was the metrics for those organizations. Yeah. So working at an NGO, I can say we argue about what the metrics should be about, uh, about something. And yeah. so having an expert weigh in on what those experts, what those metrics should be. No. So that, but the, but the bit broader question again, it's just more sort of continued dialogue, you know, office hours or something where people can get some feedback from each other or from experts curated on uh, implementation. Yeah, and I just um, I really love that question as somebody who thinks I had a lot of different competing metrics, um, but I wanted to sort of underscore that. Part of the value proposition for a forum and really why we're thinking about this is it would allow us to engage regularly with a group of experts and in an intentional way. And so, um, you know, as I, I hopefully highlighted, our reports are pretty much all ad hoc at this point. You know, we have to either be receive a congressional mandate in legislation to do a study on a particular topic or have a particular agency or philanthropic group, you know, Basically, usually approach us and say, National Academies, we want to, you know, invoke you to get a committee together to do a convening or to do a report on, say, freight transportation or carbon capture and utilization. And in particular, as decarbonization continues, as a lot of the complexities, as you continue to get into these less straightforward elements of moving down that that emissions curve, um, we think that having a standing body where we can receive regular input, like I work at an ENGO and we're arguing about metrics all the time, uh, wouldn't it be great to do a workshop-based consensus study where you know we have an information gathering session and then a committee goes and and sort of proposes a list of metrics, you know, and and it goes through peer review and all of that that folks could adopt. Um, that would be the sort of output that could come from a forum like this. Um, so it's really trying to create something that allows us to not just be purely in a responsive mode to who comes into the door, but to really think deliberatively about what we can do and engage in a nuancing way. Um, so, and and the, all this input is very important for us. Are there other, or is there one topic that is just, you can't sit on your hands about in terms of underthought about because you know what the next question is going to be what's over overemphasized or whatever what would it, be a waste of the forums yeah what, a, <laughs> what would be a waste of time but is there is there one uh, other underrepresented we see a lot on food we see it yeah you and then we'll do this here yeah, no. um i put in the comment about the synergies with the loss of biodiversity crisis and addressing those together and being more creative the example I like to give is um, Transportation Research Board came out with a report um, looking at the federal highway system and actually uh, for states recommending native species to help pollinators that they could plant along federal highways. What a great idea. The monarch is declining significantly and that's because of loss of habitat between it's migration from Texas all the way up to Minnesota, federal highways, great transportation corridors. 
So something like that and thinking about transmission lines and similar sorts of things. So I think there's some synergies potentially there. And I don't think that the issue of the biodiversity crisis is looked at enough when thinking about decarbonization, both the positive and the negative. Love it. Okay. Um, one other comment and then we'll move to our last slide. Up. Up. No, let's, let's move to the last slide up. What is, and and am I predicting it wrong? What is the question? Overhyped, overhyped. Okay, what are we getting? Hydrogen. Oh, not us yet. I love that somebody said carbon capture for the first one, and somebody said carbon capture for this one. Yeah. We're sitting yeah, exactly. exactly where we were before. <laughs> Marine CDR. Oh. Fusion. <laughs> Electrify everything. Oh, okay. I want to take that one on. Electrify everything. Okay. Okay. Who, who, okay. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me. Well, I mean, I do a lot of work in the advocacy community and I just find that there are a lot of people out there who think that they can just go like that and everything will simply become electrified and not everything can be. Um, and we all, we're always going to need to make things. And we're, so we're going to need an energy rich molecule. I'm going to need carbon from somewhere right which is the holy grail the circular carbon economy with carbon capture and, and hydrogen made from solar power right but but the point is you can't electrify everything Beautiful. And, and we will have a report on carbon utilization coming out within the next two months on that thinks that exactly we still need carbon yeah just another version or one of the things that i think uh a lot about at the policy implementation level is and you've touched on this a little is sequencing you know uh like we're pushing really hard on electrifying everything but our grid isn't always able to support that so like really trying to think about the interdependencies at the systems level about how we're trying to move forward and things and there are a lot of people that just they kind of take the message electrify everything and then it leads to counter it can lead in certain circumstances very counterproductive short-term policies Absolutely. And, we see and, that and, we see that in buildings uh, where the, the building community is constantly saying energy efficiency. If we electrify a building that is leaking warm air out of every corner, you're not going to save any on your bills and you're not going to save anything on energy. And so that's definitely sequencing and how we, you know, lump things together or don't lump things together is a pretty important piece of the process. Other, other, other ones. We've got, we've got just a couple of. Them. This is really, this is exactly what we wanted to get out of this session. I, I, you know, um, I, but I, I just want to throw in that even for those of us who make their living in carbon capture and storage, we are really concerned about being able to scale it. Scale, okay. What well, my, one of my more, one of my board members and and the staff is bored of hearing this said. Scale, scale, scale. You know, it's like real estate. It's location, location, location. With with energy technologies, having one wind turbine, having a solar panel, having a great technology isn't worth it if it can't scale. And and carbon capture and sequestration is is one of those. Absolutely. Um, other other ones that just yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's uh, would add a new another word there is economics and scale. Those two, mm -hmm. otherwise, can well. That's everything. what that was the finance. <laughs> that, you know, yeah. I, I mean, uh, how, how we do this? Yeah, others, others, keep going. Pace and scale. Pace and speed and scale was a good book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Nature-based uh, opportunities are, I think, pretty badly overhyped. I mean, I can't tell you how many papers I've read lately that say. That we'll be very, very lucky if we can maintain the present land absorption of carbon, right? The, the thought that we could somehow plant a lot of trees is just absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I was just hoping that you could speak on. I mean, we've seen there was a whole bunch on transportation, myriad transportation for the positive, several here for the overhyped. What's the role of whatever you're trying to do here to, uh, shape TRB's focus on this? I mean, they're clearly doing a lot on climate and resilience, but to have TRB take up kind of the challenge 
of kind of answering some of the transportation specific ones here may allow you to focus on other things. It's a good question. I mean, I don't want to, this, this sounds stupid, but TRB is us, you know, I mean, we're, we're, and I, I don't want to mean to say that we, we represent, they do so much work or whatever, but they have got to be part of our, they're part of our uh, team. John, I'm looking at we you. I mean, a TRB person on the staff we for have... the stud, the decarb study. We had staff from all across the academies, including TRB. And we have presented about our activities at TRB activities. And I think a future activity would, we would want to make sure people who are embedded into the TRB system are part of it so that we can make sure we're getting the absolute best transportation expertise, whatever the specific topic is. But a secret, TRB is an elephant compared to us in a good way. Um, they have they have such a broad portfolio for those that don't, you know, um, understand the academies. They have a huge research area. They they fund their own work, which is different than what we do. And so it's a it's a wonderful organization. Um, yeah. 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 Good. Uh, yes. I was going to say, I think another thing that you should be focused on, this isn't exactly the question, but yeah. what are the threats to some of these decarbonization strategies? And the example that I highlight is building codes. Um, the, the big issue, building codes are so important for energy reduction. You look at what's going on in North Carolina, where you're seeing this pushback and that we're going backwards in some states with advancing energy efficient building codes. Um, that's a real challenge. And that's something that's important to look at in your forum as part of this process. And, and certainly with the, the initial questions were on subnational. I mean, this is this is one place where subnational and even, you know, it's not even at the state level, it's at the municipal level that building codes are so fundamental um, to getting this. I I know we're we're one minute over, we're we're hanging out, but I mean this has been very successful. This is exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to tell you what we're what we've been doing, what we've done, what we're doing now, and where we want to go. And we wanted to get some feedback. And I don't know. I like to I like to declare victory rather than saying that, you know, but yeah, other uh, well, final comment. Any comment? I'm gonna make uh, a comment that picks up a little bit on that, but it's so as a social scientist, I look at all of these technologies and I think we're in, we're living in a world right now where, uh, according to some polls, half of Amer almost half of Americans think there may be a civil war, likely or unlikely. That's really incredible. You know, not that I expect it to happen, but that's a really incredible environment to be doing this kind of work in. And I think the National Academies has a responsibility from a political social science perspective to kind of take a look at how all this work on climate plays out in an environment where people believe that's a possibility. Thank you. Thanks everybody for your participation. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable.